Welcome, everybody. This is another episode of the Micro Solidarity Podcast where we talk to people about community organizing. And here I've got Stephen and Shane who have just finished running what sounds like quite a successful event called Cascade Camp. And I know very little about it apart from that um, there was a lot of pleasant and happy and excitable stories going past on Twitter. And I was like, I want to know more. What happened? And what did you learn? And what were you thinking about? And yeah, how did it go from your perspective? And um, yeah, I just want to capture any lessons that you learned while they're fresh so that we can share them with any other community organizers out there. Um, can we start? Can you just give me some of the practicalities? Like um, who's the event for? How many people were there? How long was it? All that sort of concrete stuff. Sure. Uh, the event, I, I I define the event as uh, anyone who almost like saw the uh, saw the uh, the announcement uh, in our part of the network and felt uh, like there was some resonance. And I think there was, I'm, I, I, I'll, I'd say a lot of the event was uh, faith in the network that mm -hmm. there would be, oh, we've got this great network and then let's geographically filter on being in the Pacific Northwest uh, and um, uh, yeah, Pacific Northwest or nearby, we had some people come as far as uh, I think Minnesota and uh, California, like Northern California. And there were some people interested in Alaska. They didn't make it out, um, but it was a very large, a greater Pacific Northwest event. Uh, it was three nights and two days at a, a permaculturalist uh, farm in Southern Washington. And yeah, it's, again, I think it's for the people who showed up and, um, also, uh, I'm going to say for, for the organizers, like I made this, uh, in, uh, I made this to try to appeal to like myself. Uh, and how many of, people came? It was about 40, 45, including the people who lived on site. Um, and so a, a large bulk, bulk of that was actually the org team too. So there were seven of us on the org team. Uh, what was it? Five, four people and a baby who, who lived on site, and then around you know 35, 30, 33 to thirty five attendees. So kind of small by the standards of vibe, like Vibe Camp, which was my main frame of reference for this. Um, but we were we were kind of hitting space limitations with the venue, with the capacity, which was incidentally where the Micro Solidarity Summer Camp for the U.S. was held uh, at Alchemist about a month before, which Stephen and I both attended. Um, and then one awesome. thing I want to add in was, you know, part of who we were talking about trying to bring in originally, it's this combination of like, okay, so anybody who sees this is, is you know, and, and is potentially interested in it is like, okay, you're a good candidate to come just by default. Um, of course, there's also the slightly more regional thing that Stephen was saying, we're trying to get people from the PNW for reasons that um, maybe we can come back to, but basically trying to get people to come who would potentially be part of like an in-person physical uh, community where people are, are in proximity to each other and can meet each other. And then there was this, also this thing where we wanted to get people who were interested in hosting things themselves. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think, I, think we're, I just think we're still trying to figure out exactly who we're going for and what that looks like. But there's this thing of like, okay, are, can we host the hosters or something like this? Like, can we, can we bring people together who are interested in doing things themselves um, and that was also a lot of who it was for and we're going to be doing another another thing is we're going to be doing more of these we're going to be doing these a handful of times throughout the year so this was also sort of a test case for that and that includes like okay who are we trying to appeal to who do we want to come into this that kind of thing can you say more about that um impulse that you had to host the hosts like why what's the point of why uh, so um for me that leads back to uh um i i started hosting potlucks about uh, a year and a half ago um i had uh at, at the time he was my son was one years old and it was very hard to get outside mm -hmm. of uh, the house so I, I i started hosting potlucks so people could come to me uh and then uh, after about a year of that um there, there, there was a, a phase change in the group and there were clearly just a lot more uh, relationships that existed outside of the context of my potlucks and people would put on uh, events and the scene became like very like monopolar to multipolar where people were putting on events that 
uh, they wanted to see and met their own needs. And uh, I thought that was a really good pattern that you could replicate um, because, you know, like setting up a, a regional camp takes quite a lot of effort and, you know, it can uh, drop people pretty widely and uh, connect people who might like live right next to each other, but uh, uh, never had an opportunity to meet. So I, I think part of it is like, um, hoping to see uh, a blooming of people who uh, get again just get inspired by like the social energy present and then mm -hmm. decide to uh, take it upon themselves uh, to uh, to host to take a step hosting so that they can build up a local social abundance for themselves mm -hmm. I have this impression and I don't know how accurate it is because I've just been reading tweets you know um, but I sort of feel like there's this old traditional idea of an organization, which is basically, um, you get a bunch of people, like a specific list of people that are members of that organization and the organization has a singular purpose and you kind of organize everyone to go and deliver on that purpose. And then I found that as I was growing up, you know, very tedious and not interesting. And so then I got into organizing and, um, especially through the Inspiral network where you still have a, a very defined list of people and some protocols of how do we you know, how do we make decisions? How do we allocate resources? What do we do with conflict? Like, there's a strict bunch of rules, but it's not a singular purpose. It's much more of an ecosystem of purposes. It's just like, oh, lots of stuff happens and we get excited about it and we sort of like cluster around each other's projects. And then with this, with the Cascade Camp and the network that it's, the broader network it's part of, I'm getting the sense that it's almost like there's no singular defined purpose and there's no singular defined list of members or rules or uh, it seems much more emergent and like um, uh, still somehow coherent and like it's doing things and that there's a um, there's some way of filtering who are the right people and what are the right activities, but it's just not, you can't force it into a spreadsheet or into a handbook that says this is how things work around here. Is that accurate? Yes, kind of. <laughs> we're still actively trying to figure this out. We're, act we're actively having conversations about this. Um, yeah, so the organization, we created this little sort of small container org kind of thing for it called Rhizomium. Um, mm -hmm. So Cascade Camp was not necessarily a one-off event. We're probably going to do these again. But we want to do, again, like a handful of events throughout the year, roughly seasonally, and maybe with some smaller one-offs. Like we're thinking of doing a winter solstice event. We're planning on doing one um, up in Seattle that two of the members of our org team are leading. We're also having a, we have a potluck coming up in November. Anyway, we have we have a handful of events throughout the year, each with their own name. Then we have this container org that's, you know, a, a, a handful of people at this point who are interested in varying degrees in different events and are helping to host and run the events that are going on in the network. And Stephen and I, like after, after this last event specifically, where everything kind of leading up to that was like, okay, let's do a good job with this. We'd, we'd had sort of a slightly more wide ranging and broader and kind of in some ways like idealistic, but also just, you know, very wide ranging conversations uh, a month plus out from the camp. And then going into it, it was kind of like, OK, let's, you know, let's focus and let's get this done. And the conversation shifted. I guess my point is we were having conversations a little bit about that kind of thing before. And then I think we can have more informed ones on the other side of it. But we're still trying to figure out, like. What exactly does this look like? What is the purpose of it? We were it, it, just even in the last week, we were going back um, with like voice memos over Signal, talking about exactly the two things you brought up there. Like, what is what is the sort of organizational structure look like? Like, how do we choose who to let host events? How do we like? It's maybe the wrong framing, but like, if people are wanting to host something with us and they're not they haven't worked with us before that kind of thing but if at some point it starts to it starts to be more successful so to speak in that way and other people are wanting to do it what are our principles or filters um mm -hmm. we we want to talk more about that and then like you were saying like with a sort of purpose if we have a singular purpose versus a sort of set of purposes if it's more diffuse or more concentrated we're still actively trying to figure that out and one of the things we were talking about recently is you know hosting events um one thing i've been thinking about is Hosting events is clearly a very, very good way to build community, but it's not the only way. And there's like a good hearting kind of thing where if if we focus on hosting great events, then we might get good at that. And that is probably an un unalloyed good. But uh, there are other things we can do too, like talking with other people who are hosting events or talking with people in general in the area who are interested in hosting events 
and and thinking about other kinds of things to do than hosting events to build community. Like the people out at Fractal, of course, are doing amazing things in terms of building an in-person neighborhood, um, you know, in a built building and in Brooklyn. Um, they have a little university that they have going. Those, to some extent, are like event hosting spaces, and maybe the university is a kind of event, but that's that's the kind of thing that I know that Stephen was really interested in, in when we first started talking um, a couple of years ago, and a year and a half ago, right around when he started hosting the potlucks, actually. And it's the kind of thing we're also starting to think about. Now, I don't know what that will look like, or whether that would be part of Rhizomia, or it, the extents of this stuff, but I guess my point is, is we're still trying to figure all of that out. And that's kind of where some of that goes. Mm. Mm. It's, I, I'm, I feel quite ambivalent about um, purpose and structure and things, I guess, like explicit structures, because I mean, something is drawing you forward, you know, something is mobilizing your energy consistently, something's attracting, there's something there, you know, you can feel it. there's like an organism or a magnetism or some kind of field. Um, and, and I, I, I sometimes wonder, like, is it enough to just have a, a sort of undefined illegible shared sense of this thing that's pulling us along or like when do you actually need to like pin it down like um like if you had to pin it down today how would you describe the purpose like is it um yeah is that is that something that you've given any thought to like how what what are you doing with this thing well i think uh, we discussed um like what would be a metric for success of Cascade mm -hmm. Camp. And uh, mm -hmm. I think we came up with something like uh, if in a month, like people are still talking or doing something, like if there was some, if it kickstarted some like uh, more durable uh, connection outside of the event, that would be, uh, that would be a success. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I, I, you know, I think we're going to like cook, just let it cook for a year to before we like you know really decide is there is there some exact purpose that we want to pursue besides doing vibey uh community things but i mean i i, I know for myself like i'm hoping uh and i think we all come to community like needing with different uh like asks and offers or with different like desires um and again part of the part of the benefit of having like a larger community is that there's there's gonna, likely going to be some overlap. Like uh, there happened to be, uh, I, I think uh, three parents that I met who I didn't, there are three, you know, three parent or three sets of parents. Um, one of them brought kids and then two of them didn't because they didn't know if the event would be totally like, you know, how, how it would be basically. But for, you know, that sort of like, oh, there's, you know, possibly some, um, oh, like subset of parents that I can personally relate to who also um, are initiated in the the memes of the network. So there isn't like a large cultural boundary to for me to like start like relating with them. Uh, uh, and, and so that's, you know, that's maybe going back up a second. It's just thinking about like, we all come to community with like different purposes. And I think, uh, uh, and I, you know, I saw, I saw, you know, the different organizers come with different things they wanted to do. Like uh, Octavia wanted to do a dance party. Uh, uh, Alex invited a lot of uh, people from his uh, Seattle uh, rationalist um, hmm. circle. So I've, you know, I'd say he wanted to include include those folk. Um, there were some, you know, there are some other avenues that didn't quite maybe get as much traction. Like, oh, maybe we can like uh get like a sound healer there or a cacao ceremony or something like that uh but you know just having a a, a broad enough you know it, it's sort of uh, uh twitter or x or our part of the network or teapot is 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 multipolar and it's really hard to define what it's about and i think again i think that's a a benefit i think who 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 shows up and who brings the energy uh and activation and what they're into um uh again filtered being again being filtered by uh the network like there's already a, a lot of like weekly existing ties and a lot of like depth and just creating cascade camp as a lens to like see well you know what exactly is um you know on uh you know what what is the reality that's like kind of like dimly held like 
uh, and when you focus it into real, or, you know, uh, what's the what's the reality in the network? That's sort of an image of, uh, or yeah, what's the image of the network? I'm just mat workshopping this metaphor. What's the image of the network that when you throw it on the other side of the lens, you get like uh, a rich a rich reality? And like uh, to me, that's that's if there is like a purpose, uh, it's it's something like that, like just having a lot of faith that. Uh, the people are cool and that we show up and get together like uh, amazing things happen and that feels like enough of a like a, a purpose for this you know again for the immediate uh for the immediate uh future um i have i have some yeah. stuff i wanted to say too if that's okay um yeah good th thank you yeah there's this like i don't think we talked about this Stephen. this is literally a spur of the moment metaphor thing but uh there's this like wild forest planting method um, from this guy out of Japan called the Miyawaki method, which folks may have heard of, which is um, basically a way of taking slightly denuded landscapes and planting a whole bunch of different plants, including trees, usually ones that are local to the native ecosystem there, um, in order to sort of stimulate the growth of a new forest. There's something about this like metaphor of like a slightly denuded social landscape that, um, you know, has kind of been grown out a little bit over time or like been harvested or something like that and it's not as flourishing as it could be and this idea of not trying to like control it like a bonsai tree but trying to create a lot of potential growth there um in this depth sense and even though it's maybe a little bit unpredictable or illegible like you can't see exactly all that's going on on the inside simply because there's so much there there's this idea of having like a social scene locally that is growing in depth over time with where a whole bunch of different things are happening and maybe a lot of those things are in group chats or in private communities or sort of outside of the purview of the public. But the more of those connections you have, the more alive the thing is. And yeah, so for me, there's, there's something about like, I, yeah, Stephen, I think you just asked me like a couple of nights ago, like, what do you actually, what, what do you want out of this? Like you were telling me some things that you want, like opportunities for, for not co-parenting exactly, but like having other parents it's that totally you're connected mean. to. Yeah, and co-loving situations, those kinds of things. I was, I was trying to figure it out. Um, and I still don't know exactly all of the things that I want to do with this, but there is something about like building something with friends and growing something with friends and creating something that feels really good and good to be a part of, but also like, wow, I helped to make this happen. And, and I think a lot of that, like how that gets applied here is seeding all of these things and seeing things grow with them. Um, and I guess that gets to the purpose of it, right? There, there's just so much of an opportunity to do that. I, I, there's almost a thing of like looking for community nerds, like people who are interested in, in creating their own little social scenes or hosting events, that kind of thing. And like doing our best to encourage them and give them a place to do more of that. Um, I, yeah. I feel like if you have, if you have a lot of that going on, I think that's something that people are not used to these days. And that a lot of people are really hungry for um, like maybe they're disconnected or they kind of, are used to living online um, and they want to have more in-person stuff going on. Like the whole, whole point of this is, you know, Stephen, when you were first talking about this a year and a half ago and you kind of got me enrolled in it, there was this idea of like, okay, having these regional meetups and, you know, maybe a couple of times a year. And I know that you personally wanted to meet people. Um, and I, you know, I think that the more of that we're doing and the better we're doing at it, it's like because we're doing it locally here, people can drive to see each other. People can see each other pretty often if they want to throughout the year. Um, and, you know, just after Cascade Camp, I think two people are doing, planning on doing potlucks in their cities, one up in Seattle and one over in Minneapolis. So those are some early signs that people have been encouraged by this and like more potlucks if we can have more of this sort of prehistorically <laughs> ancestral and beautiful thing of, just eating together and people coming food. Um, I feel like that's a really kind of good baseline and almost like a memeable thing. Um, but yeah, like more of this, more of all of this, mm -hmm. like a verdant thriving social landscape mm -hmm. is the, the part of the vision that I have for this, as well mm -hmm. as potentially some like slightly more concrete, cool things like um, a university style thing, which, you know, Stephen, you brought up less than a month ago, I think, and we've kind of been talking about recently. So a lot of that's still, still kind of changing. Um, and, you know, where exactly we're taking it is probably not something that we can tell or foresee at this point exactly. But those are some of the goals and some of the sort of abstract and specific things we're looking for.
Uh, one thing I want to add on about history of purpose. Um, so it was, uh, um, so I think uh, I met a lot of the Portland crew through a, a signal chat that uh, Vivid Boyd put together. Um, and uh, so those were people he sort of like one-on-one, -on -one, like uh, he reached out to them, they reached out to him. Uh, that he met, decided he liked their vibe, added, you know, great, add to the signal chat, a great pattern, by the way. Um, and, he, you know, before I had, was having potlucks, he was having some weekly things too. Um, but then, you know, he, he, uh, he had, he had, uh, um, his, his father died, um, and he took, was taking care of his mom. So he had a much bigger care burden and he stopped do, you know, hosting events. Um, uh, meanwhile, I, I, I had this need for social um connection and i started hosting events and then uh uh last year vivid boyd moved away so oh like i was joke i was joking with him hey you're like the top of our funnel like <laughs> you can't <laughs> well, <laughs> or what are we going to do without you um finding really cool people uh and like adding him to the group chat and you know of course there's like you know one-on-one -on -one, like people meeting people uh you know like maybe <laughs> slime old fashion like you make a connection and then you add them but it's like, uh, uh, you know, an event, I, I, I was imagining an event, an regional event, something more often than Vibe Camp. Um, but, you know, not not super frequent, like, because, you you know, you want there to be like enough draw and build up. So people are like, oh, yeah, I, I really want to try to make it to, to to that one. And, oh, if I miss, you know, miss this quarterly, like, there's going to be something in three months. So I'll, I'll try to make that, try to make that next one. But I think three months is about enough time to like, sort of like, you know, start really craving for like, uh, like some sort of large gathering. Um, and I thought, oh, that could be like the top of like, uh, like sort of the new top of an, in real life funnel. Cause, uh, you know, just, it's just create an environment where you can feel safe and be relaxed and like get to talk to people, uh, without there being like, um, you know, I, I because I house the Pollock in my own house, like I'm not necessarily like looking to just, have like a totally cold connection um mm -hmm. and uh so wanting like a place to um between a little bit of a buffer between like absolute you know the public of the in open internet and then like uh like my house so that's uh so there was a there was a first event um in february that had a much less catchy name that i can't even remember it's like teapot Pacific Northwest teapot regional quarterly gathering or something like that which is really meant to be like a bootstrapping like uh like oh this is this is you know a proto event that I'm hoping will turn yeah. a, a bare bones sort of thing now I'm I'm hoping will like bootstrap into something else um uh which which it did um and then you know so we've been discussing like a lot of the uh like more of the oh what could this be um but like that was the the history of like oh how how were we thinking how how was I thinking about it early on and then how what was sort of the initial vision that like got us started but uh, it's you know it's changing now that there's actually like a I'll say some sort of like uh, some sort of group Pacific Northwest consciousness achieved. Mm. Um, mm. That's awesome. Um, what what's sticking with me from hearing you both. I really like this metaphor of the like denuded landscape that then gradually becomes this very abundant forest. Um, and a, a lot of this is me just projecting, projecting my own vision, but I think, I think there's a lot of overlap there, which is, which is, I guess my perspective is like, I'm interested in just creating a lot more density of connection between people who have some kind of alignment very hard to articulate exactly what that alignment is but like i have a sense that we are living in a denuded social landscape that that people are like starving for a particular kind of companionship and that um if we can kind of find the right people and stick them together in the right way then all of this stuff just kind of grows on top of it like um oh yeah we can share childcare because i really feel like we're on the same wavelength or maybe there's an awesome music scene that flourishes on top of it or some there's like a group of entrepreneurs that started that's a new startup so it, could, it can kind of be anything that comes out on top of it but um without that strong you know that rich soil or that social fabric it's kind of like any any impulse you have is pretty likely to like die on the vine just to keep mixing my metaphors um 
So I, I really, I really connect with that. That sort of, it's almost, to me, it feels almost like an evolutionary impulse to say we're mammals. We're supposed to be in herds. A lot of us have been atomized and like, don't have enough of that uh, fellow mammals around us. And so we're just like, ah, <laughs> we put them together and stuff will happen. This stuff happens. Um, I'd love to hear more about the event itself. I feel like we're sort of like setting context about, um, yeah, the bigger landscape that you're in and, and why you're operating. But can you just tell me more about uh, how did it go? Basically, how, what was your, um, how do you feel about how it went? I think it went well. Um, yeah, throughout, throughout the event, I need to get better at this for future ones, but I was effectively always wearing my organizing hat. So there was a lot of like, okay, is everything going okay? Do I need to be here or there? Is there anything that needs to be taken care of? That kind of thing. So I wasn't like stressed explicitly, but I wasn't able to chill and sort of enjoy it. So this yeah. is just from my perspective. As far as I can tell from that perspective, things went very well. Um, and a lot of that, like it seemed like people were having a good time pretty much from the first day. Um, that was something that I really wanted. It was like, I wanted people to, to go to sleep on the first night feeling excited and happy. Um, I know that especially if you're meeting a bunch of strangers for the first time, it can be easy to like not know people and then come into a group and maybe try to make some connections or not know how to, and then feel kind of uneasy. And it can take a little while for that feeling to resolve, which hopefully it does sooner than later. But I, I think that that can happen with these kinds of things. And I really wanted to um, ensure to the best that I could that that didn't happen and that people started to feel at home pretty much from the first night as soon as they got there. Again, so they'd go to sleep feeling cozy. Um, and I think that happened. I think incidentally, this is a specific thing. We had a, uh, I didn't expect this exactly, but um, there was a big like fire pit and s'mores um, Sean, who was on the team, had made homemade graham crackers and all of the food was vegan, incidentally. And so we had like vegan marshmallows, vegan graham crackers, some nice dark chocolate. And people were just like sitting around the campfire, almost everybody making s'mores. And people would kind of come in and out and there would be conversations happening a little ways away. It was on the edge of this spruce grove that we had with lights set up. So it was kind of like a pretty cozy setting. And then again, as it got into the night, um, kind of late into the night, you know, people were sitting around the fire, taking care of the fire and eating s'mores. And it was like a very nice feeling. It was a very cozy feeling. And I think a good way to set the tenor for the rest of the event. It was pretty short. So it was two nights, three days, started Friday afternoon. Most people got there between, you know, early afternoon, mid afternoon and the evening. Some people got there after the opening ceremony, which we were planning on doing at 5 p.m. And then a lot of people hadn't showed, you know, because it's a drive for a lot of people. So we decided to push that back to eight after dinner. Um, people got in, we kind of helped orient them. People got parked, they got set up where we it was almost all camping. So we had camping out in a big field and people were getting their tents set up. Um, and that was effectively the first night. There was also a sauna on site, by the way, which, uh, I think some people use, but that was like a really nice thing. I know a lot of people on the org team and just people in general were able to go and use the sauna. Then Saturday, um, there was this thing that we did kind of to kick it off. Steven, this was your idea for like an event bazaar where people would come together. It was effectively the one big day for hosting events. So in the morning, everybody got together. We had this whiteboard and you led this round of like soliciting events where everybody was in a, in a space together. People would come up with ideas for events. They'd write it on the whiteboard. There was an opportunity for me you know, over maybe a half an hour or so for people to like talk to the people who were planning on hosting these events, kind of like get oriented with them. And then they would, you know, go and attend those throughout the day. Um, and that was most of Saturday. Saturday, incidentally, is also when it started to rain a little bit. So um, we, we were set up on this farm, Elk and Mist. It's like an experimental community homesteading kind of thing. And they had this big indoor house space that we were able to use kind of last minute. We weren't even, we, we weren't thinking we would have it going into it because a bunch of the residents wanted it as their own space. And then a bunch of the residents were out of town during the event, um, sadly in some ways, but also it kind of opened that space up for us. It would have been cool to hang out more with Denzelo and Sarah um, and Ollie who were there on the farm. But uh, anyway, we had the use of this space. So when it started raining, almost everybody was in that house, especially for dinner. It was like very full. That's part of why if we'd had 60 people, which was our original cap, I don't think it would have worked. Um, it was kind of over full, but anyway, started to rain on Saturday. So people kind of went indoors for the evening. And then Sunday, you know, people kept hanging out and then eventually started to pack up and, 
and take off. That is the very brief summary of the event. I think the rain kind of put on a, a damper on things, but overall it still went quite well and it wasn't too heavy. Um, and for next time, this isn't what you're asking, but I really want there to be an extra day. So there's more time. Um, you know, a lot, most people, it's not like people were flying in for it. And so if you're able to drive there and then drive back home, it's not that big of a stretch. I think only one person flew in for it anyway. So it's not like a huge amount of prep for such a short thing, mm -hmm. but I think mm -hmm. having at least one more day would make it a lot better and get, you know, give us mainly another day for doing events. Um, which would be very cool. So that was kind of a rambly answer, but that was that's the basic summary of, of the events and the timeline of it. And then one thing I'd want to change. Um, just incidentally, the what you said about you know your intention that people feel feel at home by the first night that they they go to bed kind of like satisfied in a way or settled maybe. Um, I'm so curious about what where does that feel like that would come from or like what are the constraints or the design principles or like what you can do as a host to make it more likely that people are going to land in a relatively easy and rapid way. Um, and you know, there's my, my Twitter bio, I call myself a vibes mechanic and I'm like, is there a mechanism? Is there a way that you can, are there things that you can do that set people up? Um, so that, that process of sort of, I'm anxious and I don't know if I fit here or not like you can get people through that um yeah I want to know what kind of how you thought about that the, the, I guess the, what I'm asking is about the social process design so the uh Alex had a really good idea the night of to do a speed friending event so it was uh we'd have dinner we would, there'd be opening ceremonies and then speed friending would happen. And uh, we got to participate a little bit in that. And what it was, was everyone who attended uh, were given some icebreakery type prompts um, to use. And then they broke off into small groups of three or four and had something like 10 minutes to talk. And everyone gets a chance to talk and listen. And then you break up the groups and reconstitute them. And I was able to get quite a lot of personally, I was able to get uh, a, a lot of benefit from that pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, um, I think I didn't, I haven't checked with other people to see, well, did they get benefit too? But I, I, I did mm -hmm. get a sense that, you know, if you participated in that, you would, you would end up with, um, you would end up with, you know, some pretty warm connect, you know, like a, a warmed up connection, right. Where, uh, mm -hmm you you'd know what someone was interested in or some of their backstory uh the you know you'd see people less as like oh an unfamiliar face and a little bit more of like oh like i know what you're about and i think there's some minimum i think there's small interventions like like that where you give you know beyond a typical ice breaker i think the you know ice breakers can be like whole group sort of things but really i think uh like intimacy like a small group where you have a little bit more time to intentionally connect with people and get a little bit more depth as more effective uh you know for having a warmer connection than like a giant like the a big icebreaker where you maybe get like a fact about someone and their name and well maybe you're gonna like forget their name anyway so then there's like an an additional like uh uh almost a, a, a headwind or something like that where it's like oh yeah you were yeah but um uh, <laughs> So I think I think I think that helped a lot. Um, also, incidentally, I think uh, it just turned out this, you know, it's like one of, the, one of these like little happy accidents, but uh, having just one place to. So there was a sort of a, a long to, to, to get to the place where you were supposed to where we had people set up tents, there was a bridge. So just a single point of entry, you'd come over that and then you drive into a field, uh, you drive through like the little spruce grove and into a field. And then we uh, had set up like a little welcome tent with all the badges. Mm. Uh, and mm. so event badges, it had people's uh, a preferred name, social media media handle if they wanted to include it and uh, like a Twitter profile pic if they wanted to include it. And um, there ended up being two like larger groups of people there. Um, as it's really funny for me, it ended up being like kind of a, a rat a rationalist and a post-rationalist breakdown. So the people are just yes and vibing chairs sort of pointing every you know at any direction and you know you you'd get a sense of like the fun games going over there 
And then there was like a, a circle of like the rationalists who were talking about uh, like AI and uh, like security, like uh, network security. Um, uh, that, that was a delightful conversation for, 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 Just waiting for him to come back. <laughs> I was just checking his. I'm back. Hi. <laughs> That's really funny. Um, it's extremely hot here, and my phone. I'm I'm tethering off my phone, and it it actually overheated, and so I've got an ice pack, and I'm like, oh jeez, <laughs> no. Where are you? I just uh, you <laughs> might have said earlier. Right? Yeah, I'm in Austria. Um, because tomorrow we have the opening of the Micro Solidarity Summer Camp for Europe. Um oh, so we have this red. It's very similar to what it sounds like Alchemist is. Um like a big farm that's an experimental community and a lot of art and um it's a hippie farm, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's that yeah. sounds pretty similar. Where, where roughly where in Austria is it? It's like an hour northwest of Vienna. Okay, cool. Cool. Welcome back, Stephen. I just my phone overheated and I had to get an ice pack so I Everything's fine. I had a I had a gremlin find out where my uh, my power switch was for the computer, so that's uh, that's my little reboot. <laughs> okay, well we're synchronized. We've got synchronized gremlins. That's really convenient. Um, I oh we were I was asking you about how do you help people feel at home. Uh, you told me about the speed friending, and then you were describing that there's these two clusters of people: the rats and the post rats, or like. Maybe I'm thinking it in terms of communities I've been in where you kind of have the the brains and the hearts or something like that, you know, like these different mutually supportive clusters. Yeah, it just it just turned out that way that um mm -hmm. again at the place where everyone was coming in and and getting their badge, that there were two groups of people with broadly inclusive discussions going on. So you could just pull up and and start listening and uh, you know like your pick pick your vibe sort of uh yeah. pick your base yeah. character vibe template sort of yeah. choose your adventure yeah. free thing yeah. going on um yeah. and uh uh i don't know how i would replicate that but i thought it was cool that it existed uh again maybe just having you know like the welcoming committee i know they do that at burning man where it's you know you get a welcome home and uh which is it's a nice way to uh start when you've uh, made it through the caravan and you know, had your ticket. So just having there be be someone there to like say, hey, hey, here's mm -hmm. like your your name badge, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, like here's what we know. I I don't think we gave much instruction actually about what the welcoming committee should do. So it just ended up being like you know hanging out, which was fantastic. You know, like come and uh, uh, there's like some immediately available like social ability to like socially connect with people. Um. Uh, you know, sort of implicitly friendly, like groups that are just there. Um, yeah. So I think that worked I've, out. I have a sense that like there's some, there's there's almost like a hierarchy of design concerns um, that if you, if you don't get the, if you get these things right, then you kind of set yourself up to have a really good event. And if you get them wrong, then you, 
you, you say you can do all these other things and not make any headway so like having that experience where someone genuinely feels welcome when they arrive like they get some human contact and someone's like oh i'm so happy to meet you repeating back your name you know and this like um whether it's at the welcoming desk or in the icebreaker activities this thing of like i'm speaking and i'm getting recognition that i'm being heard you know like this very basic simple thing that if you if you have some attention on that at the start to make sure some of those basics are being met then people are likely to just be able to kind of I don't know, mm. relax and become instinctive, you know, and just drop into the flow with everyone. And then all the magical mm. stuff happens. But if you don't get some of these like basic requirements in place early, then you'll just lose people and they kind of check out of the process or they get really in their head or really anxious. Or it's like, oh, there's something, you know, get, get really focused on what's not going well. And you kind of never get into that flow. But it sounds like you've got some people maybe that just sort of intuitively have their attention is kind of naturally pointing in the right in the right direction so those things are taken care of yeah I, I think i think so that was actually there's one thing i want to do better next time which is have the registration desk sort of more consistently manned <laughs> where mm. i don't think it was it was just it, it worked it actually worked pretty well um so maybe there's nothing that needs fixing there there are a handful of people that were kind of trading off that function and then for a lot of it there were like six to eight people who just were happening to hang out just like it was a like a good natural place like hanging out around the the booth there um and i don't think anybody was like insufficiently onboarded at least for the first setup of like here's where you should camp here's where you should get your stuff set up that kind of thing um mm -hmm. <clears throat> i you know I, all of the people who were there i was there for a little bit and there were there were a few others who were kind of trading off for a good chunk of it at least taking care of bringing people in everybody who's there was friendly and amicable and um wanted to help yeah get people set up kind of in that humane way not just like practically here's where you go but like talking to them there's a part of a thing here where i'm reticent to scale too too much beyond the size that we've been doing um like i think of course there are upsides to that but the more people you have the harder it is to have a, a human connection with each one of them as they're coming in and it's like uh, icebreakers are often seen as a group activity but there's something about like well it can also be a very personal and individual one where we were saying they're rich about like okay when people show up um is there somebody there who's who's actually with them like actually talking with them and not just like you know giving them practically the things that they need but also kind of engaging with them as a person and getting to know them a little bit um yeah, yeah it's like i remember you know and maybe it was just the org hat that I was wearing, but I remember wanting to do that with people, the, the handful of people that I helped to get oriented. There was a sense of like, okay, I want to make you feel <laughs> like I'm here with you. Like, I don't want this to be a perfunctory thing. Um, yeah, it's very much the sense of like, when you're getting in, I think it's, it's part of that is like, okay, how, 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 do I, how do I want people to feel when they're first arriving? A part, you know, it's also just people are interesting. Um, so the people who are showing up were like kind of predisposed to be cool and interesting and exploratory people who are, who are, you know, interested in checking this kind of interested in checking this kind of thing out. So it's like easy to be interested in, in them. Um, but yeah, there, there is the sense of wanting that to be the case from the get go as a side note, the way that you set up this question, Rich, I'm curious about the hierarchy of event mm -hmm. design considerations thing that you were talking about, like, you know. Mm -hmm we're doing more of these pretty soon and I'd like to have some things fresh in mind. So if there are like opportunities for advice or lessons, that kind of thing that come to mind as we're talking about this, you've already been doing that, of course, but I'm really yeah. curious to hear what those are. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Um, it's not really clearly articulated in my head, but it's um, the sort of first things that come up are like, yeah, it's really about the welcoming experience. Like how do people, how do you guide people through that transition from, I don't know anyone here or I've just got the normal level of anxiety about being in a new group to, Oh my God, I found my people. I'm settled. I'm happy. I can take risks. You know, I can um, share about my dreams or my fears and feel at ease. Like how do you get people over that metaphorical bridge? Um, and I, and I, in my head, there's kind of like layers of it. Like there's this, there's this fundamental physical animal layer of like, uh, where am I sleeping? Where's it's like yes yeah, sleep washing toilets food like there's some basics like is this a safe habitat for me to be a person in uh and getting that orientation and, and you know like where are the hazards if we're if we're out in nature um and then there's that next layer up where you go like yeah am i going to be 
heard or seen or recognized or like are people going to be interested in me um do i have an opportunity to say something and know that it's landing or not landing or like um can i shape this process in any way like are there am i is it like i'm receiving this event from the top down or actually it's being co uh, you know i'm co-constructing it somehow um i have this thought that like when i arrive into a new space i'm kind of a baby essentially and that i need to have i need someone to take care of me roughly at the start and then i very rapidly become an adult and when i'm an adult i have agency i have autonomy i can make choices i can sort of like create the experience that i want to have but um while i'm a, while i'm an infant i actually need someone to take care of me and taking care of me is like yeah someone who has been around the block before has taken a little bit of extra effort to say welcome we're so excited you're here i'll help you set up your tent or you know like these are some things that you need to know about and actually like you were describing have this experience that someone's with you they're not like just broadcasting at you but with you um so yeah there's this sort of like as a host i think um you start out in this like super empowered position and your job is to like activate the natural agency and and empowerment that everyone carries around in them but sometimes sometimes the flames need a little fanning or like sometimes you feel really inhibited um yeah that that it seems to me it's that threshold if you get the threshold right i mean the fact that there was a bridge um a physical bridge i wouldn't underestimate that either like the way that the architecture can help people like um so iwan who owns alchemist i met him at the first micro solidarity gathering we did in the states in colorado and um, that's also <laughs> where sarah who's also living there now they, they met each other through that event um, and at that event, we started with a huge amount of anxiety because it was kind of like peak COVID times and there had been an outbreak and people were freaking out as they were arriving into the space. And then as we were during the orientation process, we did a walk around on the land and there was a, this sort of like um, sculptures installed on the land. And the first sculpture was basically like imagine a door, like a door frame and a door just like in the middle of the forest. And the host of the land, like, opened the door and took us through and sort of said like, Hey, <laughs> you're crossing a threshold now. Um, and I felt, I honestly felt like as every, as the whole group went through that door, all of the stress and anxiety about COVID and stuff dropped. Um, and it's like we, that, that sort of like physical object kind of symbolized, Oh, we've, we've finished with all of the before time. And now we're here. Now we're at the thing. We've all arrived. We've left behind our previous cares and concerns. And there's a kind of like jubilee feeling, like a blank slate feeling. Um, like, okay, let's get on with it. And I, and I feel like the bridge is another. You know, it's like the foyer. It's like this kind of a pattern of architecture that, that signals, hey, hey, different parts of your brain, some of which are not like super intelligent. <laughs> you, are, you are now in a different place. You know, we're doing different things. I think that helps a lot as well. It's like the Christopher um, Alexander, like a pattern language kind of a thing. It's like a liminal thresholdy space where you're entering a space. It's like one of these core things that you have as space design. I kind of cut into you. I didn't. Sorry for that. No worries. I was just going to share one more quick example. Um, I was involved with a kind of like underground punk hardcore scene, music scene in, in Wellington. And a lot of the activity there happened in this big warehouse apartment. Um, and there would be a show there at least once a week. You know, you might get 300 punks show up and the place routinely got trashed, as you can imagine, with 300 punks um, until someone, one of the residents of the house had this brilliant idea, which was instead of like, hey, just find your way in off the street and up the five flights of stairs and then land in this rooftop like apartment space and then be an anonymous member like in the crowd, always make sure there's someone at the front door literally just welcoming people and saying hi oh you're here for the show that's so great welcome to our house where we live you know we're excited to have you and just giving them that like signaling <laughs> you've been seen you're not anonymous also this is our house like have some respect like it just completely changed the whole vibe of all of the events that happened there and much much reduced the level of damage as well um so yeah thresholds i think thresholds are a big part of it that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, I think part of it too is that most people who are coming to this, effectively everybody, it's, you're either driving, or th again, I think one person flew in, and either way you're driving mm -hmm. in. So there's like an hour and a half from Portland, longer from Seattle. It's like exhausting. 
Um, and I know especially, uh, I think three people came up from San Francisco, including Brooke. It was really cool to see Brooke Sweet. and to get to talk with her a bit. But um, that's, a, that's, a, you know, that's an especially onerous drive. It's like 12, 14 hours, that kind of thing. Um, so I guess my point is, is there's like a lot of sort of exhaustion coming into the event. And that's a little bit of a part of it. But especially, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a part of like the entry liminal process is there's this long journey to get to the thing which is kind of cool in its own way, but also exhausting again. Um, and so for people, people who are just coming in, looking back, it kind of happened incidentally, I think just based on the quality of the people who are um, helping to bring people in. But there is something really important there about like intentionally giving people a cozy place to land so that when they come in exhausted, they're kind of given the orientation, they get set up and then they can just relax and you know, start talking to people and, you know, in the way that maybe they're sort of physically exhausted, but a little bit mentally used to being self-contained because they're driving, um, there's a sense of like, okay, letting them chill and suddenly start to like stretch a little bit socially and, and emotionally um, and mentally. That, that seems really important. I mean, one of the things is, so Ewan, who you mentioned, really, really cool guy. He has Alchemist that he set up uh, over in Skamakaway, which is where we had this, of course. He also has Bridge Space here in Portland. And that's where Stephen, you did the February event, and for the potluck coming up in November, we're going to be using that space again. Um, so you know, Ewan is like central, like oh, critical to true. everything that we've been doing and are doing at this point. Um, but yeah, I guess my point is, is with that, with that bridge space, it's effectively all one big room. And so this, I'm just bringing this up because I'm thinking about it. And it's relevant to what we're talking about. I'm thinking now about like, okay, how do we make that? What's the entry space there? What does that look like? It could just be mm. people at the door mm. kind of bringing you in, like outside and kind of bringing you into the space and giving you a brief orientation, like having somebody posted up there, um, or having a few people kind of taking shifts or something like that to like give people that soft entry and to help them come into the space. That seems really important. I mean, another thing that, you know, like when we first started talking about this, Stephen, you brought up something having to do with like space design, where when people drove in, there was the registration desk that was pretty central to where all of the activity was going on. Like there's a field on one side of it, which is where everybody was setting up the tents. There's a yurt r right behind it as you're driving in, which was where dancing and stuff was going on um, and music the two nights. And then on the other side of it, there's the little spruce grove and the fire pit. So it turned out to be, this might've been, I think this was a, a little bit of a part of our consideration of why we had it set up there, but it was like very central to the space. And something that I thought worked out that I'm trying to figure out how to replicate for the, the bridge space event coming up it's like different little hubs of activity. So like one or two main hub spaces where it's big enough for almost everybody, if not everybody, to like hang out in the same space. But then in this sort of naturally happens, but in some ways it's maybe harder to do out, out at Alchemist and out in, out in public or just out in nature. It's like little nooks, like little places for a couple of people to sit and have a somewhat private conversation and feel sort of self-contained and like they're in their own little thing. Um, you know, that's just this, this a natural part of a larger space. It's not the kind of thing you can necessarily create in a short amount of time. You could do that in, a, in an indoor space. And that's something that I've been thinking about a little bit. And I'm now thinking about kind of more about bridge space. It's like, again, it's all one big room. So that is the hub. But if there's not a place for people to go and chill that are sort of little cozy spaces, I don't know, I, I, I'm rambling a little bit. But again, it's just like part of the thing of like the hierarchy of event design considerations physical space and how they set up social dynamics potential for, for different kinds of interaction seems really important like having main hub spaces and then having little little side spaces that people can feel especially cozy in yeah i met we just arrived today at a new venue we're, we're hosting the european micro solidarity summer camp here tomorrow uh, and i've been walking around the space kind of envisioning how is it going to be used um and what's coming to me is it's almost like a um archipelago like you want to have these small niches like you say where little clusters of people can hang out and feel like they've got most mostly private space and you want these larger spaces where there's more of a gathering for everyone can you know like one big circle where everyone can meet or like a workshop for half of the group there and it's almost like you want them within spitting different distance of each other so that you can you can kind of see the landscape and you're not 
it's not like there's one over there and one way over there where you're like, oh, I feel a bit awkward. I don't know what to do next. And, it, and it's kind of a huge mission to find the next thing, but they're, they're discoverable, you know, like they're kind of all these different vibes are adjacent to each other and you can kind of just organically stumble your way through. One, one little side thing. I, there. Um, this is, oh, oh, just uh, about Elk and Mist. This is kind of tangential. Um, but you, there was something that you said that reminded me of this. It's like this sense of like potential discovery. And I don't I, like, this is not something, mm. you, I, it's something you can design to some extent, but it came with Elk and Mist as a, as just a part of the uh, makeup of the space, like the anatomy of the space is there is the central area where we're, we were hanging out and then little things kind of at the periphery and in some sense hidden around it. So they had these, like these sort of climbable, metal art sculptures that were set off that were maybe a couple hundred feet away from the main space but kind of around the bend and you could you could sort of see them but um just from some angles and these were really cool they're like climbable metal lily shapes mm -hmm. that was something to go check out and then elkin mist also has these like sky celia like these sort of net like climbable structures set up between trees and there were three of them and it was very easy to direct people to one of them and then there was another that it was slightly harder to direct people to. And then there was one that was kind of hidden up the mountain that I didn't know the location of. And there wasn't a clear way to direct people, but I, I was able to tell them like, you know, during the opening ceremony, there's a third one of these that you can almost go on a treasure hunt for or something like this. Um, you know, there was also like a beaver dam that we set up at the Micro Solidarity Summer Camp a month before. Um, I guess my point is, is like, it, I don't know how much this actually impacted things, but I think on a subtle level, level it has to have where in the space there's there are things that are known and that we're able to quickly orient people towards and then there are things that are slightly more on the outside of it that are interesting that they can go and check out and then even some like hidden slightly exciting things that we can hint at and uh, you know that just feels cool there's something about coming into a space and having a sense of the known and feeling safe in that and then also having things that you can discover that you sort of in some sense have to go discover on your own you know you go in little groups like, like let's go check this out even if you don't do that it seems like having that kind of thing is cool and helps to set a, a set a vibe that yeah. is interesting and again i like i don't know you can choose to construct those things you can set those up wherever you are you can create that kind of dynamic i don't know that you have to but it came with elk and mist and i'm just noticing it seemed like a sort of understated part of what made the space special yeah, it's one of these things where reality has a surprising level of detail. Like there's like an infinite amount of attentiveness you can put into making optimizing a space for a particular kind of vibe. Um, I was gonna ask a question, sort of thinking about people who are listening to this conversation and thinking about um oh, maybe I want to be an organizer or I'm nervous about being an organizer, but I can feel like there's something thinking about those people. Um, and I wanted to ask about before the event, I'm assuming there was some parts of the process where you were feeling nervous or like, oh, I don't know if this is going to go well, or like, this is stressful, or I feel like there's a big risk here and we don't know how it's going to go. Um, can you talk about, yeah, any of those kind of sources of anxiety or stress and like, and how did that play out in, in reality? I can, so that's, that feels like it's a really good question for me. Because the first time I held one of these, I was, uh, whew, it's like just huge, huge pits of anxiety, huge knots of anxiety, ta saying to myself, oh man, even if, if I'm done with, a after we're done with this, I'm not sure I'm going to do it again, because it's just so stressful. Um, but, uh, so I'm trying to figure out what made it that way. I think part of it's just like, um, actually just, uh, Fried Swift on Twitter, she's, you know, maybe it's a, mm. and she's called it something like, you know, the, the happy or, you know, the birthday problem. It's like, is, is anyone going to, to show up to my birthday if I, if I have this mm. thing? So there's a huge amount of like, just, I am putting myself out there and like, it's going like, uh, yeah. And no one could show up. Right. So there, there is, there's a level of inherent social risk there. Um, but uh i'm just trying to figure out like so after i'm trying to, after that first experience um 
I realized that I needed other people to do this with. And it was just too big of a big, it was too big of a lift. Uh, I'm watching my kid here, so I'm going to pause for a second. Hey. Doing great um, multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, he just needed a little attention. Um, let's see. So, yeah, the first time I I can't even recount all like the sources of anxiety that there were for it. Um, but uh, I, I I made an announcement to the uh, to the Discord like I want to hold the second one, but it's not going to happen unless I have other people who can help mm -hmm. me do this because I'm 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 a father like I've I've got a job. Uh, there's just, and then it's, it just personally was too, it felt like too much of a thing to bear. So, uh, and, uh, one of the first people, the, the, I, I reached out to Shane specifically because we'd been talking about this sort of thing and he helped with some, some pretty big lifts for the first one, uh, to just like, uh, um, yeah, help with some pretty big lifts for the first one that made sure it was able to just even exist. And, uh, I think a, a lot of, I don't know there's again it's like a co-regulation thing right where if i can talk through this and it makes sense to like one other person and we both feel like we're seeing like the same elephant or it's like oh yeah like there's definitely something here like oh yeah this is worth worthwhile going towards uh it relieved a ton like my anxiety was maybe a hundredth like it was it was just such a different story so i i, I mean my main takeaway is like find find a collaborator who who thinks it'd be really cool to do something similar and um, uh, find a collaborator who, who, who you can just talk with and uh, uh, about logistical things, about vision, vi visionary things and, uh, or, you know, co-founder -co collaborator. Um, and uh, that, that relationship like held me through like being able to, uh, um uh i mean you know uh, held held it so i could um i don't know i'm trying to figure out what how, it's just yeah just re release held it how, made me feel held so there wasn't nearly as same amount of anxiety that there was um i think so the question right like um the question you asked rich was uh i'm i think i'm gonna take a break here for a sec like five minute break um actually i'm just going to take that break right now <laughs> um i, got, I can yeah, come yeah. in yeah. yeah yeah i've got i totally have stuff to say on this uh, yeah it was also everybody on the org team there's kid i see kid um kid needs kid needs you um any anyway everybody on the org team was really really good and it was good working with them i think part of what but i don't know how replicable this is for other people who are hosting events i think it varies from person to person like how much how many people you're near near to or in your area who are like able to help and interested in helping with this kind of thing it turns out partly intentionally and partly sort of unintentionally there were a surprisingly large number of people so there were seven of us on the team total um steven was the one who set th this event up you know we're talking and then i came in pretty centrally so i was like the chief coordinator sort of making sure everything got lined up and then we had uh, five other people who came in and helped with different things so garrett came in and helped with the tea house and also helped with sort of initial orientation stuff he took over the tea house um bra or octavia came in and was doing music and also helped during the event with the opening ceremony and the closing ceremony with sort of what we were talking about and just structuring that and also you know also was speaking during the opening ceremony especially but was sort of like our audio tech person um Alex was really central with leading up to the event, all of the logistical things, like taking notes during meetings and also just coming up with good ideas for things. It was, it was actually, it was really nice. Like during the event and after the event, um, I think he's moving uh, early this coming year. So I think he's going to be leaving the space. We'll see. But he was, he was bringing up like future looking sort of future oriented, like what is the future of this space? Is this, I, you know, I don't want to speak for him exactly, but he was like asking very good questions and bringing up very interesting things sort of outside of what I expected of him. And I was really, it was really delightful. Um, let's talk with him about that. So anyway, um, Fitz and George were our main chefs. 
And so we had, so doing a bunch of food prep, we prepared all of the food. We had some pre-bought stuff, like a few things, I think, like snacks, that kind of thing, coconut water. But effectively, every one of the meals and most of the snacks that people were eating um, were made by us and made specifically by, by George and Fitz. So like, like we we're talking, we did a debrief meeting after, after the camp. Um, and uh, some of the main things that we were talking about improving for the next time were food prep. There was also some event stuff like event design stuff or space design stuff, um, that came up, but a lot of it was like doing, doing food prep better next time. Having said that, I think it went really well. Like, I think that they're in the sort of the meat of it or whatever, they're in the nitty gritty aspects of this. But from my perspective as, as somebody who was just like, I was worried about food going into it. Like, are we going to have enough? Is it going to be prepped on time? people going to enjoy it that kind of thing as far as i could tell it went it went really well i think there were maybe one or two meals that were 10 to 15 minutes late which is inconvenient but not that big of a problem you know um so i think there were i think they were sort of very conscientious during and after about how to make things better i guess my point with all of this is we had a surprisingly large number of people who were really competent in different ways leading into the event and during it and also after going going into future ones so um you know the way that i brought this up originally was there was sort of like a happy accident kind of thing and then an intentional thing most of the people who were on the team four out of seven of us came from portland and we already all knew each other going into this um and then three three people came from seattle from the seattle area broadly um wait am i getting my count wrong there no no i'm not uh one from tacoma and then two from seattle proper anyway all of the people in portland broadly we're part of this teapot network and most of them were through steven's potluck there was one who was a friend of mine who was part of this little side group chat getting into weird inside baseball stuff but anyway it was all part of like this pre-existing network that we already had established and that was very intentionally established first by gabe and then passing the baton sort of to steven who was doing the potluck so those those like connections were preceded and then incidentally there were also you know seattle's a big city there were also a bunch of people in seattle who were kind of starved in their own way for social connection. I don't like, I think for a variety of reasons, Seattle has a slightly more diffuse um, social scene with this stuff than Portland does. And I don't know exactly why. And I also don't want to speak overly on their behalf, but I've heard this from the people who attended and from other people. I think it has to do with sort of a tech transient thing where people will come in to work for companies and only be there for a few years and then leave. And so, you know, if you make a relationship with somebody or, or if you're part of something, you're not necessarily going to be there for that long. And they might not be there, you know, the other people might not be there for that long either. So there's kind of a less of, less of an incentive or less of a feel that you're becoming a part of something that feels more durable. Um, so anyway, a bunch of people in Seattle who are looking to have more durable social connections. And I think all of the people who came from Seattle, in fact, I know all of the people who came from Seattle had that feeling. So I, like I couldn't have anticipated that. I didn't know that at all going into it, but it happened to work out that there were a, like, it was a preceded densely connected network of people here in Portland that was pretty intentionally created first by, you know, Gabe and then Steven. And then as a sort of happy side effect, or just a happy thing that happened, like there were a bunch of people who in, from Seattle who were interested in creating stuff that lasted. So because of those two things, we had a lot of people. We had a surprisingly large number of people who were able to act very, like, very well and very well together for the event and going forward too. Um, so, so, kind of coming back to it, like, I don't know how much of that can apply for other people. Like, it, it probably depends dramatically on where you are and what your current social scene looks like. But to this point of what what that did, that was like crucial in terms of making it happen, making everything run well, giving it a good feel having it be cohesive for the people who are running it. Um, that was absolutely central. So I forget exactly what the question was, Rich, but this was, this was heavily, you know, feeding on what you were saying, Stephen, about like, mm -hmm. you know, our, our dynamic and our relationship and the, you know, the way that we have conversations about this stuff. That is also, that is, you know, these are both core to the thing, but like having that very close working relationship and friendship and also having a bunch of competent people on the org team like if you can have those, and I think there are things you can do to probably create a higher likelihood of having those, whoever you are and wherever you are. But like if you can have those as an event organizer, that makes everything so much easier. And having those relationships be solid and like communicative in a constructive way and getting a chance to get to know each other better and, you know, having the kinds of conversations that, you know, all, all of us as a team had and that you and I, Stephen, have had 
those are crucial for that kind of thing. So again, if anybody's like listening to this, who's wanting to do more stuff and they're feeling a little bit like, I, you know, I don't know where to start or the whole thing is making me anxious. I think having people, and you can do it intentionally, having people that you're, you're developing a stronger relationship with to host these kinds of things will help you immensely, like immeasurably, probably more than any single other thing. Just yeah. saying that from the outside, but crucial. Yeah. So throughout, throughout the time of hosting potlucks, I I'd say I was keeping track of like who showed up in which way, like I, I've joked, um, I've joked to you that, Oh man, you're my right hand potluck man or something like that. And now it's like, well, you were the, you were the chief coordinator for mm -hmm. cascade camp and you're like co-founder for rhizomia now. So it's like those relationships, like, I mean, people will show you who they are like pretty early on, I think. And then it's like, uh, uh, that, you know, then you can, then you're probably, I feel like once, once, once you have a sense of someone, you can try to do a project with them and kind of like escalate, escalate the amount of commitment and, mm. um, like, uh, collaboration that mm. happens. Uh, uh, George cooked for the first, uh, the, the February meeting and he you know I, you know I, he he was in food service he wanted to be a chef it's like oh cool like like just saving that like knowing who to come to because they've been showing up all along uh I think is uh, an important pattern so just note again like uh, noticing who's good at what who likes doing what so it's not like an so it's not some sort of like surprise or overextension or like I, I'm not sure I can do that like uh, I just found people who all you know we're already wanting to do and already showing up for like roles that I know we would would need. Um, you know, uh, uh, Ra uh, slash Octavia, uh, uh, similar. Um, she uh, came to the first February event and she did the sound system. She she DJed. She set up DJing for other people. Um, and uh, you know, again, like broadly broadly competent person. She was you know doing. She ended up doing the same thing for 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 Cascade Camp. Um, uh and then uh yeah like Fitz was also there Fitz I you know I, I got to talk to him like he you know he's one of these like uh outside of the initial circle because he's in Tacoma and I hadn't met him he showed up to the first uh he showed up to the first uh uh meet uh the first party the first event and uh it became very clear like oh he did like uh he was a uh, part of vibe camp like logistics like specifically food i think he did like the hog roast or something like that mm -hmm. like one of the one of the earlier vibe camps so it's just uh um yeah yeah so there's yeah there are existing ways in which people are showing up and which they have like you know either latent or already expressed like potentials or roles and then i think it's uh having a good organizational sense of like what you need and then mm -hmm. Uh, filling it uh, uh garrett and alex were uh, get, uh again just bro like both like broadly like competent people um we, we did a once they were on we so we did a like a survey like a survey uh gather or a survey meeting at uh, elk and miss and they were both like helping us with like recording Garrett stepped to, to do some sound system stuff for like some videography we we're doing. He flew a drone. Um, uh, Alex helped like record video. Like it, it, there's just all these things that came together where it's just like, uh, um, yeah, also that, that gathering where we were first, like the, like six, six out of the seven uh, of the coordination team were like there on site. Mm -hmm there was just like this palpable feeling of like, oh, like we've got it all like held down. Like there's like the competence exuded from the group and we just got things done. Um, and uh, I haven't felt, I the way I've felt with like a team uh, or, you know, mm. I haven't felt that way with a team, like a true like team from the, from almost from the get go, like with too many, too many projects I've been involved in, but like, it's a good, you know, there's a really good felt sense of um, uh, of of team teamness, uh, and I think yeah. that's a... mm. hey 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 hey. We're not we're not doing this right here. Come here, come here. Yeah, that's right. Come on. We had, we had the, gone we out to Elkin at the same time. Second. 
Okay. We we've sorry, done it. Shane? Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> this is one of those things. Um we yeah, we'd done it, like Stephen was saying, we'd gone out to Alchemist to check this stuff out. And we shot a video. We didn't actually use the video, which is silly. Mm -hmm. We we spent some time and like shot a video on site of us talking about the event. We were gonna put out as a kind of like promo pitch and way for people to see the space. Um and then we did a little side video with that. But anyway, we didn't actually use the video. But the hidden upside of this is we all got to work together on a micro project leading into the thing over the course of a couple of hours. And we hadn't had a plan beforehand. I think we talked about it briefly, but we hadn't even like we weren't sure we were going to do it. It was just like an idea that I had. I had some experience with this stuff growing up. So like I was like thinking in that way. So we decided to shoot a video. Um, and it just so happened that Alex and Fitz, who were there, had cameras. I forget whether or not, I might have talked to Alex. We talked to one of them about bringing some equipment up. So we had some prep there. Anyway, this is all kind of a side tangent, but like the opportunity to work on something together and to get something done all together as a team felt really good. And that's what you were saying, Stephen. It was like, it felt incredible. It felt like, okay, this is working. Like we can actually work on stuff together and be, do it well. Um, we got everything that we wanted to get done, done in a fairly short amount of time, including checking out the space and, you know, figuring out what was going to go where, doing sort of like a logistical check to make sure that we had everything that we would need. You know, we didn't end up needing it, but we were thinking of getting porta potties. We probably would have needed those if it were closer to 60 people. Um, we were able to do a lot of that stuff leading into it. So just in terms of group cohesiveness and actually getting things done, I feel like that cemented things early on. I don't know how much of this is, is, um, transferable to other people's experience, but probably more than a bit more of it than I'm, um, yeah thinking right now you're like having an opportunity to get things done in a group setting with the group of people that hopefully you're working with to plan this kind of thing um seemed to do a lot for us so i'd mm -hmm. recommend that um i think it's kind of my job to figure out what's transferable or to try and identify mm -hmm. like how to package your local contextual knowledge into something that's transcontextual um that's the job i find most amusing and delightful um and so i'm like busy writing notes as you're talking and I, yeah i've got a bunch of things that i'm i'll see if i can package those so like first of all i want to say the birthday party problem of will nobody show up um to me the consequence of that going wrong is that pretty significant that like if you take this risk to put on an event and then it doesn't work like i think for a lot of people they would take that as a first of all, very discouraging for their future organizing, but also they will potentially take it as like a, a significant hit to their self-esteem, like potentially long-term, like, oh, this means that I'm not cool or people don't like me or I'm somehow, I've got some deficit, you know? Uh, whereas from the way that you're describing what worked for you, I would say if no one shows up to your birthday party, is it, what's happening is you're just like not in touch with where the collective energy is and it's not reflection on your lack of character or anything like that, but it's just like, hey, you want to put more attention on cooking up some smaller, closer collaborations and trying to sense into like, where is the, where is this bigger group? Like, who are we actually inviting instead of, oh, I hope all of the people from Twitter show up. No, but who are like the 30 mm. people you're excited about? And maybe five of them actually can come through. Um, yeah, this gradual escalation of commitment that you mentioned, Stephen, I think this, the kind of ramping up. Um, makes intuitive sense to me and makes it more likely that you're gonna i think there's like a healthy amount of anxiety as a as a host like if you're being ambitious and growing and stretching there's these points of discomfort where you're like oh god i don't know if i can do this um and that there's the kind of right amount of stretch and you can overdo it and freak out and have a really stressful time that's really unpleasant or underdo it and never push yourself out of your comfort zone um that first thing you said, Stephen, basically the 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 meme that I have for it is never host alone. Like I just, I'm not interested in facing that level of anxiety by myself and having to metabolize all of that while trying to hold the group. It's just so indispensable to have at least one collaborator where you're like, we're on the same level. I can be open about everything that's going on for me. We can do some task distribution between us. Like sense check. No, man, you're stressing about that. It's pointless. Don't worry about it. Like all of that prioritization stuff. Um, is really, really gold. And then the other thing that I just wanted to mention, um, which more ties back to something was, you were mentioning earlier about like, if this were to scale, how would you maintain the sense of conviviality and intimacy? Uh, just to say that like, how we're dealing with that in the micro solidarity network, um, which I'm reflecting on the sort of intuitive process we've been through, is instead of scaling 
guests, we scale hosts. So like we're really focused on cultivating lots of hosts. And that sounds like what you said at the start about hosting the host. Like instead of saying like, oh, we've got this really cool thing. Do you think we could invite 600 people here? Which is interesting to go in that direction. I think that's what Vibe Camp's doing and they'll keep growing and good. That's a that's filling a useful niche in the ecosystem. I'm more interested in like, can we find, if we had seven people on the hosting team this time, can we find 15 people that are excited about hosting next time? And like, you know, maybe we get in the background and we're just like mentors or cheerleaders or something and they're leading. And um, that's how we've been doing it for micro solidarity. So like me and Nati around the first one with some helpers and then another crew stepped up to do the, the next summer camp and we were helping them. And then that last year's crew is now in the helper position for a new crew that's running the one this year here in Europe. Um, and that, that having that like successional leadership we call it hermit crabbing. Like you, you leave your hermit crab shell and you move into the next bigger shell. Um, to me, it feels like we're building up this extraordinary amount of hosting capacity so that if we, I don't see a time any time in, in the next few years where we're going to have a thousand people at one event, but I can easily see where we have 20 events with 50 people in each one, you know, and that, that to me just feels way more aligned with the kind of um, culture change that I'm excited about. Um, so just throwing it in as, as, a, as a, um, a subtle suggestion, I think. <laughs> go small, go small. Um, I'm eager to wrap up the conversation reasonably soon as we are. Yeah, like I say, we're about to start the Micro Solidarity Summer Camp here in Austria. Um, I had one more question that was interesting to me. Um, and then maybe we can do, we'll answer that question. And then any last thoughts and comments from you two that are still sitting on your chest? Um, my question was just, I knew that you went to the American Micro Solidarity Summer Camp immediately before Cascade Camp. And I'm just curious if that had any influence or like, were there any nutrients that you picked up? Oh man, this was, this was a big one. Um, uh, I think Ewan might've re-suggested it to me, but it's like, like once you've been there some amount of time, I think a day, uh, so, uh, at, excuse me, at the first Micro Solidarity Camp, I had a, actually a really tough time like landing because I went with my kid and I didn't have support and uh, I was camping and it was just like, I, I have to set up so much stuff. And um, uh, I also don't know how to be as a parent, like around other, like a group of like relative strangers. So, uh, uh, and uh, Sarah ran, um, I don't know what you, I don't know if you call it, but it was like a temperature check. All right. How, you know, it's been one day, like how, how is everyone doing during the morning check-in session and she's just you know hold up hold up hold up a hand you know five for amazing one for terrible like where are you and uh, you know most people like four fives you know there's a couple fours and then you know I stuck out because I'm like I was like at a two or three or something like I'm having a really hard time and she was it was a, she was able to uh give the floor to me I was able to talk about like difficulties as a parent like uh how do I relate how do I um how do I ask for help like even with people who I don't uh uh and no super no um and uh that that changed the experience for me it, it let me sort of um bring out my internal stress and just have the group hold it uh and uh you know so it was internal where it's like oh i just need to like get that out there and represent it and now it's like better and then some things were you know social where it's like i don't know how uh I, I think someone someone asked me a, a really good question before I went into that, which had me prompting like, oh, how my other parents relate to or how my other people, excuse me, relate to like my kid because like they don't know my parenting style. So I, I got to talk a little bit about that to like, um, I think that's some social information, which is really valuable. Um, uh, we I put that into play with my, uh, I think the uh, during that, during the first morning, I think, or maybe no, I think it was at lunch or something like that. Uh, so not, not the first morning, but at lunch, I just got to check in and ask people like, you know, how are, how are you doing? You know, one to five, uh, saw, you know, lots of fives and some fours. And then, you know, like the other, uh, the other parent with her kids was there with like a three or three or two. And I, we got to focus the attention on her and we had a discussion about, uh, um, you know, she was worried about her kids being annoying. Uh, and it's like, uh, most people are like, oh yeah, no, like zero, zero, zero. You know, there are some ones it's like, Hey, realistic. I, as a parent, were like, oh, my kid's here. Like I'm, you know, I'm at a three kids are, 
<laughs> it's gonna be kind of uh annoying but it, it it ended up being really like it ended up really being really like, tension releasing i think she ended up feeling held even you know even though my story uh Maybe I tell that a little bit uh, silly, but it, it ended up being really tension releasing. And I think she ended up having like a much better time afterwards, just like a reality check, like social information, like how are, how am I showing up? And for you know, most people it's like, yeah, this is fine. Like I like having kids around here. You no know, kids have, kids have, kids bring a lot of a kind of energy and some, some energy is really good. And then some of the energy is like, you know, kid energy and you maybe need a little bit of a buffer, but it's like, it, it, it grounded things out and made things a lot more real. And I think the issue that is going to come up, you know, you don't you don't know which issues are going to come up for people, um, but just having a group process to, um, yeah, take private information and turn it into public social information uh, is really is really important. And I think that, uh, yeah, I, I I think I felt the the vibe shift a little bit more into like mutual support or something like that after that particular temperature exercise um that's that's the main one that i remember and i'm going to use going forward as an organizer that yeah. i got from micro solidarity um I, i'm sort of hearing that on two different levels so there's the like very specific social technology of you can do a temperature check and focus attention on anyone's frustrations and like help them go through that tension release process um but then there's a sort of like more subtle thing i think which is like going to a micro solidarity gathering before your own event sort of put you in touch with oh this is what a wholesome group feels like i remember this you know sort of um calibrating your intuition so that when you get to your one you're primed and you're like because i think so much of the stuff it's not about oh i run this script and then i run this script and then i run this script and then i get the outcome it's like it's an intuitive process of just responding to what's coming up um, but you can prime your intuition. You can kind of calibrate it. You can kind of like tune the instrument a little bit, and and hopefully that's part of what the network's doing. Shane, did you did you want to also answer that question? Yeah, I can give it. I can give you a, a few things. <clears throat> this was stuff I really wanted to go check this out. Uh, the summer camp, kind of both log like logistically, or in terms of how how they were using the space because we were sharing the space. You know, it was, it was elk and mist, so. I wanted to see how that worked. I also wanted to see what they did like procedurally hmm. as far as hosting things and putting things on. We were doing our own thing, so I wasn't going to just crib everything, but I wanted to see, you know, if there were lessons to learn. And then also sort of like vibe wise or, um, you know, subtly and emotionally what it felt like and try to pick up as much as I could consciously or, or semi-consciously how they did things. And to the you know to the extent that I wanted to have that same feeling, I feel like there were lessons. I guess two main things. One, and this is not specific to micro solidarity, but I like the idea of it. And it, I don't know how things would have happened if we hadn't had this conversation or if we hadn't gone to it. But there was something about the open spaces where, okay, the morning of, we're all together. Let's talk about the events for the day. And if you have an idea for an event, step up. And you know the way they did that practically was a little bit different um just in terms of how they solicited events but the idea of us doing that very publicly as a single group yeah it was 100 percent what we did in our own way um and that was central and then another thing and this was partly due to the, the the limitations of the space like it's a farm there's only so much infrastructure set up there was quite a bit actually but in terms of food serving stuff we had to like this was the largest event that alchemist had ever hosted with you know 45 some odd people um total it, like i saw micro solidarity they made use of the space very well and then looking at it i was like okay we're going to need to do quite a bit more even like we, we would have to double the food serving space and so we did that but a lesson that i learned from there is we shouldn't go for 60 people we should not try to stretch the event space that much um but you know and part, part of the reason for that was like i was just saying the actual space itself and, and the capacity that it had for that in terms of infrastructure. But also there was a sense of, okay, if we have so many people, we're kind of going to get a washed out, a slightly more washed out feeling of intimacy, you know, with the people who are attending there. So after, after going to that, I was like, maybe we should shoot for more like 30, you know, like, ori like originally before going to that, we were talking 30 to 60, somewhere in, in that range would be good. 
you know, more people is better because more tickets sold is better and blah, 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 something like that. Um, after, after going to that, I was like, well, no, maybe, <laughs> maybe we should shoot for more like 30. Um, and it ended up being again, about 35 tickets sold, I think something like that, 33 or 35. I think that one or two people couldn't come kind of last minute as happens with these things. Um, and that actually felt really quite right. We were able to do everything that we wanted to do in terms of seating, you know, like we quickly set up some like bench, new benches with live edge wood slabs that they had and, you know, set those up, got a couple other tables set up for food, which is one thing I was worried about. We, we handled pretty well, I think. Um, but yeah, in terms of lessons learned from the micro solidarity summer camp, two main things, one sort of open space, like event solicitation thing that I think worked really well. Um, and then two, the, the number of people and a lot of it honestly was just the feeling of intimacy that you had when there were only 20 some odd people mm. at the micro solidarity summer camp that felt really good. Like I got to talk to everybody, you know, um, within just a couple of days of being there. And then got to have slightly deeper conversations with people, depending, you know, on where we were and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, yeah. And I feel like that second one is actually pretty crucial. And that's part of the conversation about scale, like scaling. It's easy to satisfy this need to grow things because growth is one sort of measure of value or something like that. But <clears throat> like the sense of like depth over breadth, you know, mm. like having tighter social connections and having that feel better for the people who are there. Uh, you know, and what you were saying earlier, Rich, about like, okay, if you have 20 events with 50 people per event, you might have the same total number of attendees as if you had one event with a thousand people. Um, like, I don't know, like the, you know, we're, we're aiming for our own thing here, but there is something about that that fits exactly with where we're going with this. And it just ties into that last conversation. Anyway, I'll wrap up with that, but those yeah. are, those are two things. Hmm. Yeah, I think the 20 times 50 is much harder to get to, um, but much more resilient and much more gratifying and much more like, I don't know, I'm just excited about it in a way that I, I'm not not interested in doing the the mega, the mega church vibe. Um, I'm, I'm keen to wrap us up. I feel like I've, I've got like 15 questions that we haven't touched. Um, but that's the way with these things is it's like a infinitely dense fractal of information. Um, but I wonder if there's any the last thing sitting on your chest that you really um, want to name or reflect on or any message you want to leave with people or any, yeah, any kind of last words before we say goodbye. I just, I'm noticing curiosity about, you know, um, hosting hosters or uh, hmm. you have your own, uh, I can't remember what you said, but you, you're basically or the hermit crab sort of metaphor of like, um, well, we'll move up to like a new game and someone can uh, attend this game we've gotten started, uh, which is, you know, the MISO camp or, you know, the sort of like training, training organizers uh, to step into new roles. And I think that's that I, I, I just got a lot of interest around mm. that. Um, so less of a comment, more of like an expression of like, yeah, that feels like the right way to go for, um, you know it's like so social abundance for everyone <laughs> united uh, uh what is it uh uh ubi uh yeah it's a basic social abundance or universal basic social abundance or something like that is uh um occurring to me as a a good target for uh, oops -a. Oops, -a. oops -a. oops -a. <laughs> that's me that's thank me. you rich uh, yeah, yeah. I, okay, so just briefly, I guess a couple of things. One, I sort of a pitch. Um, if you want to check more of these events out, Rhizomia on Twitter, and we'll have more a handful of times throughout the year. The next one, we're planning on doing like a big communal harvest feast thing. Still figuring out the exact language. I don't have a name for it. We don't have a name for it yet, but that's coming up in November here in Portland. Um, another thing, I don't. I, I forget if we mentioned this earlier on. But we had a public conversation, like a live Twitter conversation with Brooke, um, mm. Brooke Bowman from Vibe Camp, uh, maybe a month ago, month and a quarter, something like that. Anyway, that was really nice to have. And I know at least one person who came specifically because of that, who mm. I ended up having a really good conversation with, um, Stuart from Idaho. Um, uh, you know, it's not really like we didn't do that to get the word out. I guess that helped with it. You know, maybe that was a part of it, but it was partly just 
partly for our sake, edifying in terms of being able to talk to Brooke and also nice to do. And the kind of thing that like, it was a little test case of like, okay, how did this feel? How did this go? How did this work? And I thought it went really well. Um, and I want to do more of those. We were talking, this is one of the things that I think Alex was bringing up actually from our org team on the tail end of the event. Like should do more of those conversations. Like in the same way that you, Rich, hosted the Teapot State of the Network meetup, uh, or, you know, meeting, public conversation between you and Jess and Brooke and Kali. Um, that like I watched that. I think that, that was really good. Like we want to do our own versions of those, you know, maybe not with a whole bunch of people on the same call or maybe, but like doing sort of public conversations with other people who are hosting events. I think that kind of thing, like creating those connections across the network publicly, people who are talking about this kind of thing is not just good for a sort of cross pollination of ideas. It also sort of sets a good model of the kind of thing that we are talking about, like having a sort of slightly more distributed network of people who are hosting things as an example of more of that, where I think more of that is broadly better, everything else taken into consideration. So we want to do more of those. I also, it was really nice talking with you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, like I, I going into this, I wanted to talk to Brooke publicly, um, probably before the event. And I also wanted to talk to you too. Like we've never talked before, but you, you know, you've done so much of this stuff, your, your experience with this, of course. And so a lot of this was you asking us questions. I have stuff that I want to ask you too. Um, so, you know, at some point, if you're down, I'd love to have another sort of follow-up conversation. Um, but yeah, that, that is a kind of thing, like having more public conversations about these kinds of things seems mm -hmm. very good. And I, I want to do more of that. Um, so that's, mm. that's not, it doesn't pertain to this event exactly, but it does, it does to this idea of creating a sort of thriving social scene that's moving from online into in-person stuff and um, doing it in a not overly centralized way where it's like once a year with a big event, that kind of thing, but like more often in smaller gatherings and yeah, creating a sort of thriving, thriving set of different spaces that are doing these things. So anyway, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time. This is really nice. Oh, that's really sweet to hear from both of you. Um, it makes me want to, I guess, like let you know. Um, yeah, for me, the Micro Solidarity Network is a place for organizers to meet each other and give and receive support and exchange notes and you know just collaborate, um, and get inspiration. Um, and the space is open. You know, we've got an online meeting every month, and then a gathering in the states and in Europe once a year and then like a smaller gathering that happens in winter which is more sort of like network governance governance type of thing um and and that to, to me that's like an infinitely scalable place to catch organizers and connect them to each other and then there's me uh, as an individual who's not infinitely scalable but um infinitely curious uh basically i'm available and and you can feel um somewhat entitled to my time uh, as as organizers, I think what you're doing is really, really crucial and extremely high leverage. And that make um it's for me, it's really crucial that you two get to keep doing this for a long time and don't burn out or have these like disastrous conflicts. Um, and I wanna help you not do that. <laughs> um so public conversations I have an infinite capacity for. I'm always up for talking to people about their organizing and putting it somewhere public because then other people can learn from it. And then privately, like one-on-one -on -one advice, that's my paid gig. So you can you can book me on my website. Well, you can book me on my website with both the, the, the public one that's going to be an interview or the private one that you're going to pay for. Um, but yeah, to me, it's just essential that we have this, the rhizome, right? Like this, this mycelial network of people um, helping each other figure this stuff out because it really feels like we're making headway and it takes all of us um and it's so exciting to me i just feel like so delighted and um inspired and, and it's i get so much nutrition out of connecting with people like you all and and knowing that yeah you're taking care of your neighborhood and that like it feels like we are we are we are you know gardening these abundant forests that like w I have, I guess I have this like naive view of the past, you know, the good old days where people used to just take for granted that they live in a village surrounded by people that um, have their best interests at heart. And they're like constantly cooperating in very intuitive ways. Um, I don't know if that place exists or not, but that's where I want to go. Um, and it feels like you all are part of the team making it happen. And I'm, yeah, I'm excited to help. And, and uh, to me, it's essential that we do this learning in public. So I'm glad that you've been willing to share your lessons in public. It's really generous and courageous and jolly good. Jolly good. Cheers, Rich.
Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you again. Good talking.